So welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, you're in the right place if you want to learn how to build happy homeowners. If you want to learn how to build a better home, this may not be the right place. I'm not here today to tell you how to build a better quality home or a remodel. I figure that if you're here at IBS, you all know how to build a quality product. Instead, what I want to share with you is some new perspectives and approaches for dealing with your homeowner, which is the part of the job that can be the most challenging for many of us. So my intention today is to give you some new perspectives and approaches for interacting with and communicating with your uh, homeowners and hopefully inspire you to have more confidence when dealing with your clients and to know that you have the ability to not only build a better quality product, but also to build a happy homeowner, which is the ultimate referral source. So let me give you a little background on myself. I've been in construction for a little over 25 years. And for the past 17 years, I've been an owner's rep. Now, do any of you know what an owner's rep is? Show of hands, probably some of the custom builders do. So um, I am a professional consultant that's hired by homeowners that are either building custom homes or doing high-end remodels to integrate, communicate, and coordinate between the homeowner, their builder, architect, interior designer, and all of the people that are involved. I'm also a business coach, and I work exclusively with residential contractors. Now, as a business coach and as an owner's rep, I've worked with many contractors, and I've seen the good and the bad. And most of the challenges that I've seen are in dealing with the homeowners. So I'm going to share with you today many of the lessons that I've learned. Also, it's important that you understand that I come from a different perspective than probably many of you. As an owner's rep, I'm speaking from the homeowner's perspective, which can be very different than the builder's perspective. Now, I also travel around giving presentations to various construction organizations about these lessons that I've gained from this perspective. I'm called the Zen Builder. So I hope to share with you today uh, a little bit of my insights and maybe even a little bit of enlightenment and hopefully a little humor as well. As my Zen master says, there's no enlightenment without laughter. OK, so let me start with a little story about Zach and Zenya. So Zach was a builder I worked with a few years ago that was hired by my client to do a $50,000 kitchen remodel. And um, his home was in San Diego. It was built in 1927. So I know I'm here on the East Coast. 1927 isn't that big of a deal. But in San Diego, it's a big deal. I mean, this is like an antique, right? It's a relic. I mean, it has special historical designation. It even has a bronze plaque out in front of the house. So this is the kitchen remodel. It turned out gorgeous. And for me, it's my most successful project on house. So I've gotten 25,000 hits on this job in house. And how that happened was it got written up in a house article. Now it's been in like three or four house articles. But it's just it's gotten tons and tons of hits. So for me, this is one of my most successful projects. But for Zach, that's not the case. What happened was that the homeowner had a falling out with Zach. And um, he's never spoken with him since. So Zach hasn't gotten a single referral from this job because he can't even call the homeowner. So well, what went wrong? Well, obviously, this is a gorgeous looking kitchen. And it wasn't ha didn't have anything to do with the quality of it. It had to do with his fact that he did not build a rapport with his client. So something happened about halfway through the job. And you see the dog in the picture. That's Zenya. So he was part of the problem. So for some reason, about halfway through the job, Zenya, every time Zach would show up, Zenya would get scared and go and run under the owner's bed. And this just freaked out the homeowner, because he didn't know what happened. You know, Did he kick my dog? What was going on? And Zach just never addressed it. He just thought, you know, hey, I'm here to build this great looking kitchen. And you know, I don't really care if the dog runs under the bed. So it's ironic, but at the end of the day, this beagle ended up impacting the success of this job more than the quality of the construction of the project. So what's the moral of the story? Well, it's this. A quality construction project does not always guarantee a happy homeowner. 
Probably many of you have had this situation, right? You finish a project, it turned out great. Super high quality, it looks gorgeous, but for whatever reason, your homeowner wasn't happy. Have any of you had projects like that? Yeah. So why did that happen? Well, it's because a homeowner often judges the success of a project by focusing on the construction process rather than the final product. If you go back and you look at those jobs that you had problems with, I think you'll find out that it had more to do with the process than it did with the final product. See, Zach, like most builders, was so focused on the product, so focused on getting that kitchen to look correct, that he ignored the process. And he never built a rapport with the homeowner and handled the issue with the dog. You know, it's not always about the finish line. It's about the steps that we take to get there. Now, as builders, right, we're so focused on that finish line. We're so focused on finishing the project, bringing it in on budget and on time. And often, we overlook the steps that are needed to, to get us there. The challenge for us, each of us, is to find the Xenia in each of our projects. You know, we all have them in each of our projects. And it may not be a dog. It may be the spouse. It may be a neighbor. Or it may be that brother-in-law that's giving bad advice or even just an idea or an issue that came up during the project. But our challenge is to identify our Xenia and learn how to deal with it. So Zach learned an important lesson on that job. He now realizes that he is building happy homeowners as well as quality projects. Now, some of you may be saying, you know what, I just don't want to deal with the homeowner, right? I'm a builder. I'm not a psychologist. I don't want to deal with them. Well, you have to realize that the homeowner is part of your project. And you can't just skip, skip over the homeowner's part of the project because you want to work on the building part of the project. It's like your client saying, you know, I just want to skip over the framing and drywall stages. I just want to focus on the finishes because that's the fun part. You can't do that. You have to focus on all of the steps along the way. OK, so why do we want happy homeowners? Well, happy homeowners are our best referral source. They're our best source of new business. I just came from a presentation, and uh, this high-end builder was talking from Naples, Florida. And he said, unquestionably, his number, one refer his number one source of new business is referrals. And you're obviously not going to get referrals if your homeowners aren't happy. So believe me, you're going to get a lot more business from referrals, from prior clients who are happy homeowners than you will from a bunch of great looking photos on your house website. Again, I'm not here to tell you how to build a better quality product. I'm here to tell you how to improve your process because it's by improving your process that you're gonna build happy homeowners. So what are the keys to building happy homeowners? Today we're gonna to talk about three. The first is understanding the homeowner's perspective. Second is effective communication. And third is managing the expectations of our clients. OK, so first is understanding the homeowner's perspective, which can be very different than ours as construction professionals. But in order for us to understand and deal with our homeowners, we must first understand their perspective. So the first thing is to realize that they have little to no experience with construction. I loved what Peyton Manning said this morning at our keynote um, address. And you know, he said, I think you guys all think that we're pretty, pretty clueless or we don't have a clue. You know, us homeowners, we don't have a clue. He's right. He's right. I mean, that's what we think. And he's right. They don't have a clue. They really don't have much experience about construction. And one of the most important things is that they don't understand that a construction project is a process. It's not a product. And that's why they get hung up oftentimes with the process, like Zach's kitchen remodel. So once they understand that it's a process, then you can help them to become happy homeowners. OK, so the next thing is that they don't understand that a construction project is very different than most other uh, products that they buy today. So, you know, you can't go onto Amazon and buy your new home and have it shipped to your house the next day, right? Even a kitchen doesn't come in a box. 
But in today's world, where so many homeowners are used to being able to do that, to buy most of their products that way, it makes a home construction project very challenging for them. So the first thing is that there's variable pricing. You know, they're so used to being able to go on, uh, to sit down at their computer, they go on to Google, right? They get prices on their product from five different stores. They know exactly what they should pay for this product. Obviously, you can't do that with a home construction project. Second, or really the same thing is, you know, it's variable pricing. So if they're doing a remodel and they go out and they ask three contractors for prices, they get four different prices. They don't understand it. And sometimes when I go to try to talk to them about doing it on a cost plus basis, then their eyes really glaze over and they just can't figure out how I could possibly buy something and not know what it's gonna cost until it's done. The next thing is that it's a lengthy process, right? In today's world where you can get onto Amazon and buy just about anything and have it delivered to your doorstep in a couple of days, a home construction project is very different than that. And that's very challenging for homeowners. So it a, takes a long time to get it done, and the pricing is very difficult to understand. The next thing is that they really don't know what they have until it's done. And this, again, gives them lots of anxiety, lots of uncertainty. Now, part of the reason for this, we know, is because they don't really know what they need or want until the project is done, right? They're always changing their minds. And you know what? That's OK because this is a process. And like I said, most homeowners start their projects not really knowing much about construction. And even if they told you, oh, we know exactly what we want, we've got 200 pictures on house, this is exactly what we want, they haven't gone through the process. You know, they haven't really gone through and really thought about everything along the way. So they're going to make changes. They should know that, you should know that. And oftentimes, you have to educate them on this process to let them know about this, because again, they don't really understand this. OK, so the next thing that we have to deal with with homeowners is this mistrust of contractors. You know, no matter how much professional organizations like NAHB or NARI have done to try to improve our reputation, there's still this perception among the general public that the construction industry is dishonest. Too many people have seen those reality TV shows, right? Have any of you seen those? This is my favorite. It's called Catch a Contractor. <laughs> so this aired on Spike TV. It ran for three seasons, and it was a big success. So the premise of this show is the producers would go out, and they'd find a homeowner that had been ripped off by a contractor. Not hard to do, right? And they would set up a sting organization, and they would have the contractor, they'd find a way to get the contractor back to the house. And once he got back to the house, then they would force him, they'd turn the cameras on, and they'd force him to, out of embarrassment to fix the job. So, I mean, we may laugh about this, and it sounds like, oh, it's just, you know, TV. But this is how homeowners form their opinions about general contractors. So this is the casting call that they used in order to find homeowners to, to sign up for this. So this is what they said. Got screwed, stuck with a messed up home because your contractor did shoddy work or walked off mid-job. Adam Carolla wants to make it right. He'll get you retribution and make that SOB fix the mess free of charge. So you can just imagine what the tone of this TV show was, right? You'd watch one episode, and you'd never want to hire a contractor again. OK, so they don't understand the construction process. And worse than that, they don't trust us. So the next thing to understand is that we are dealing with a very valuable and sensitive possession, which is their home. You know, for most of us, our home is our most valuable asset. It's the most valuable thing we'll ever own in our lives. And not only is it our most valuable asset, but it's our sense of security, right? It's our nest egg. And now a homeowner has decided to make some changes to it. And not only are they making changes to it, but it's going to impact the value of this asset. And they want to make sure that it's going to positively impact the value. So they've put a lot of pressure on themselves before they embark on a home construction project to make sure that it works out well. OK, the next thing to understand is that we're having very intimate interactions within their most private spaces. So when we do a remodel, what's the two most common forms, uh, two most common rooms that we remodel? Bathrooms and kitchens, right? 
These are the two most intimate spaces that a family is involved in. And it can be a little awkward sometimes when we go into those spaces. I know sometimes when I go into a master bathroom, I can tell a lot about a person's private life by going into their master bathroom, sometimes too much. And kitchens, kitchens are the heart of the home. I just came from a presentation and House was talking about some statistics, and they said that 60% um, of people spend three or more hours a day in their kitchen. And we don't realize that, right? We just think we're going to work. If we're doing a kitchen remodel, this is what we see, and we just think it's our workshop, right? But this is what really goes on inside a kitchen. It's not just where they prepare their meals. It's where the, home, it's where the kids do their homework. It's where everyone comes together to hang out. And again, we don't realize that. And sometimes the homeowner doesn't realize how disruptive that's going to be as well. Again, educate them about these issues. They are clueless. They don't know about this stuff. But the more that you can help to educate them and get them to understand that, the better chance that you can create and build a happy homeowner. OK, so another thing that I like to do is I send out an introductory survey to my homeowners in order to try to understand them better. So one of the first things I ask them about is what their preferred contact method is, right? There's lots of ways to get a hold of homeowners. And to have a successful project, you've got to be able to get a hold of your homeowner. And it's different for different people. It can be different between the husband and the wife. Take my wife, for example. You know, if I was to call her right now, even though she knows I'm here um, you know, at this uh, presentation and maybe I need something, I can almost guarantee you she won't answer the phone. And if I leave her a long voice message, hey, Sue, this is Ed, and this is what I need, blah, 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 I can almost guarantee you when I get back to San Diego on Friday, she still won't have listened to that voicemail. Now, if I took my phone out right now and I texted her, I bet you in 30 seconds I'll have a reply. So I find that's true with a lot of housewives. You know, My wife, she runs her life on text messages. right? She's texting our kids about practice and other moms about carpools. So that's a way that you can speak the language of the housewife. Now, my dad, on the other hand, if I sent him a text, he would never reply, right? Because he doesn't text. He doesn't even have a keyboard on his flip phone. And you know, if you're dealing with a business professional, an executive, for the most part, they don't want you sending text messages, right? You've got to either leave them a voicemail or send them an email. Now, I did have one CEO, this is kind of funny, where he loved to send me text messages. And I, I didn't believe him at the beginning. You know, I, I, he filled out his survey, and he said, text message is my preferred method. And I, so my, the very first day, I left him a voicemail. And he replied with a text message. And so I got it, and I figured out. And from then on, every time I text Michael, he would reply right back. I don't know how he did this. If he was like sitting in the boardroom, like texting his contractor during boring meetings or something, I don't know. But, uh, but he, was, he was the one exception. So the next thing that I ask people about, but after the preferred contact method, is the level of communication. You know, do they want to be copied on all emails, or would they only want to be copied on emails where certain decisions need to be made? And you know, again, it's different for different people. So the wife, maybe if she's super involved, she wants to read every single email. Particularly for me as an owner's rep, you know, I'm I'm texting, I'm emailing, you know, subs and lots of other detailed emails. Some clients want that, others don't. Now, you know, you kind of figure this out during the job, right? You start to figure out how best to get a hold of your client, how much information they know they, they want to know if they start asking you, hey, how come you didn't send me this? But why not ask them at the beginning? Why not give them the survey? And then from the very first day, you know what your the preferences are of your homeowner. OK, so after preferred contact method and level of communication, the next thing I ask is a couple's decision making. So you know, is the husband going to make all the decisions? Is, are the, is the wife going to make all the decisions? How many people have had a job where the wife made all the decisions? So yeah, this morning it was like more than half the room. Um, I've only had it happen a couple of times in San Diego, one of which I actually just finished. And I didn't even meet the husband until we were done. And then on the last day, he came in, and, and I met him. Um, you know, another thing sometimes they'll tell you is, well, you know, the husband, he's going to make all the decisions related to the budget. And the wife, she's going to make all the design decisions. Well, we all know that's a recipe for disaster, right? You've got to nip that in the bud from the very beginning. And you just explain. You say, look, you know what? There's not really very many design decisions that don't impact the budget. So 
you guys have to, have to get together on that. Um, I think it's so important when you're dealing with couples to make sure that they're on the same page. When I sit down with a couple, I always ask them this question in my, when I first meet them. I say, you know, do you know what the most expensive part of your construction project is going to be? And they'll say, oh, you know, I heard it's the cabinets. Or, well, it can be the flooring. You know, we had a friend, and they spent a ton on their flooring. And I tell them, no, it's the divorce. So that's the most expensive part of a construction project. And once I get their attention, I say, look, I'm going to do everything I can in my power to make sure that we never incur this most expensive cost. So a lot of what I do is going to be so we can avoid this most expensive cost. OK, so the next thing in understanding our homeowner's perspective is identifying and dealing with difficult clients, right? We've all had those difficult clients. So in my 17 years of dealing with homeowners, I have realized that I can find out if a client is going to be difficult based on asking them one question. Does anyone want to guess what the question is? Who wasn't here this morning? Anyone? Any ideas? OK, here's the question. What do you do? So I have realized out of all of my years of doing this that I can basically tell if they're going to be a difficult client based on what their profession is. So I've put together my list. I have my top four. And uh, I want to do a little audience survey here. Let's see. You guys tell me who, who you think are on my, my list of top fours. Anyone want to guess? Engineers. OK. Lawyers. Anything else? Engineers, lawyers? Doctors? OK, there's one more. Accountants? No, they're close, but bankers? Yeah, designers? No. Well, I mean, those could be on there, but, but here's my list. Okay, so number one is engineers, right? That's what most of you guys said. That's what they said this morning as well. We all know engineers, right? Why are engineers so difficult? Well, for a few reasons. One is, you know, they're used to being experts in their field, right? They're used to knowing everything that, about their subject or thinking that they know everything about their subject. So, um, uh, and the thing is that, again, they don't know a lot about a home construction project. You know, even if they're a construction engineer, like this guy designing a bridge, you know, I'm sure he's not worried about what kind of flooring he's putting in that bridge. That's not going to be a big crisis for him with that. So, it's funny, two days ago, I was at, a, I was at dinner, and this guy walked by me. I knew he was an engineer, because he was wearing this t-shirt. And I just cracked up. And I had to stop him and, and talk to him. And um, so I, I, of course, asked if I could take a picture of his shirt. He said, sure, but don't take a picture of my face. So I said, OK. And then I told him what I was going to talk about here at IBS. And he totally agreed with me. He said, oh, yeah, oh, well, we're just difficult. And I loved what he said. He said, you know, engineering is not a profession. It's a way of life. He said, I approach everything with a certain way. And he said, and I know, I'm a, I know I'm a pain in the butt. And his wife is there going, oh, yeah, he's a pain in the butt. <laughs> so you know, another thing about engineers, this is really important, is if you think about what does an engineer do, they're always re-engineering things, right? So they're always changing things. And that's what they're going to do with their home construction project. So that's really important to know. When you get an engineer, they're going to make tons of changes. You just you know that. So make sure you've got good change order language. And we're going to talk more about change orders later in this presentation. OK, number two, doctors. Doctors, why doctors? Well, they're kind of similar to engineers, right? They're used to being the experts in their field. They're used to kind of, they're used to being the source of answers. You know, life and death, death issues, and it's up to the doctor. But again, they don't know much about the home construction process. So that whole, and not only do they not know a lot about it, but all of those uncertainties that I just talked about, very difficult for a doctor to handle. So another thing, if you're doing a remodel with a doctor, what I found is they have a real hard time understanding that every house is built differently. So I had one client. He was a surgeon from Phoenix. His name was Dr. A. And we were doing the demo, and we found a gas line in one of the walls that we wanted to, to remove. And he just couldn't understand why we couldn't have known that that gas line was there. And finally, I got it. And I explained to him, I said, you know, Dr. A, you could look at 1,000 people's forearms and the radius and the ulna are in the exact same place. But you look at 1,000 different homes, and the gas lines are in a different place in almost every home, unless it's a track home. And then he understood the process better. OK, number three is attorneys. All right, some people have them at the top of the list. Um, I've got them third. 
uh, again, what, remember that mistrust of contractors we talked about? Attorneys feed on that, kind of almost unconsciously. You know? But they've seen those reality TV shows. They believe them. But the other thing about attorneys is if you think about it, they're in a profession where they're paid to not trust people. They have to think about, well, what if something goes wrong? And so that's part of the issue with this in dealing with a home construction project. So one of the best stories that I've ever heard about an attorney was um, I uh, gave a presentation in Minneapolis last year. And um, a contractor there had his attorney draft up his construction documents. And then two or three years later, the attorney became a client of his and did a remodel. And when he gave him his construction documents, he wouldn't sign them. <laughs> OK, so number four is not so much a profession as it is a lack of a profession, right? Retired people. Retired people, we've all dealt with retired people, right? They have lots of time on their hands. They dig into all the details. They ask 101 questions. They're at the job site more than you are. So OK, so this is my list. This is my list of most difficult clients. So what do we do about this? Do we just avoid these people? No, I don't think so. I found that if you know in advance that what they do and you know what their tendencies are, then you can anticipate it, right? If you have an engineer, talk to them about changes. Explain your, your procedure for change orders. If it's a cost plus job, explain how their changes are going to impact that. Every time they bring up a change, make sure that they understand that it's going to impact the budget and the schedule. If you have a doctor, document everything. Copy them on everything. Give them air on the side of giving them more information rather than less. And if you have an attorney, make sure everything's in writing. Just document everything. Now, some of you may say, I got a better idea. I'm going to just, when people call me up and they want a, a proposal, I'm just going to say, so what do you do? And if they tell me they're an engineer or an attorney, I'm going to say, you know, I'm really sorry, but I'm booked up till like 2019. So, you know, thanks. So I think that's a mistake. Because what I have found is that difficult clients can be some of your best referrals, right? Dr. A was a total pain for me. But now he's one of my best references. I've gotten so much business out, out of Dr. A because I understood him and I knew how to interact with him. And he knew he was difficult. And he probably had lots of bad experiences with other people that didn't understand how to deal with doctors. OK, so let's go back to Zach. So Zach now has realized that on every project, he's building two things, right? He's not just building a construction project, but he's building a relationship with a client as well. OK, so now that we understand the homeowner's perspective, let's move on to the second uh, concept, which is communicating effectively with our homeowners. So in today's world, there's lots of different ways to communicate with people, right? But the challenge is to know which methods to use to be most effective, like we talked about with my wife and my dad and the CEO. So I've identified five methods of communication, and I'm going to share with you how to best effectively use each of them. So the first is text messages, right? Everyone uses text messages. We know that they can work, but again, in certain circumstances. So another thing is the group text. Some people dread the group text. They never, ever use it. There's definitely wrong times to use a group text. I'll tell you, be very careful if you ever put your homeowner into a group text, because if you have your homeowner and your subs together, and you know, two months later, he goes back, and he starts talking to the subs, and he thinks he wants answers right away. So there's two great ways to use group text. One is, I think group texts are great within your crew, right? So if you've got four or five guys working on something, you're trying to get an answer quickly, that's the best way to do it. Even if you need some interaction, it's going to be a lot faster than trying to get all of you guys on a conference call. The second group text approach is when you're dealing with couples. So that's how I make sure that the husband and wife are on the same page. If I need a decision made, I'll send a text message to the husband and the wife. And that way, when the wife responds, the husband will see it. OK, so next are voicemails. Voicemails are a terrific way. If you want to just download a bunch of information, give an update, voicemails are a great way to go. But remember that a voicemail is a one-way communication. So you can't really get a decision made on a voicemail. OK, third is phone conversations. So in today's world, so many people, they don't want to talk on the phone, right? Send me a text, leave me a voicemail. But in construction, communication is key. 
So don't overlook the importance of a, getting your client on a phone conversation, or even better yet, a face-to-face -face communication. Okay, here is my fa favorite method to communicate, which is emails. Emails have transformed the way that I manage construction projects these days. I can manage multiple construction projects now that I could have never done 10 years ago. But it's not just about sending emails, it's how you manage and work with your emails. So here's a couple of things that I do. First off, in my email, I use Outlook. I create a separate folder for each of my projects, and I move all of my emails into those project folders. So at the end of the job, I have a full documentation, but even while the job's going on, if I want to find a, a message or something, it's easier to go back to that. So another great idea that I implemented that someone told me is I have a waiting for reply folder. So anytime I send an email out that I know needs a response, I put it into that waiting for reply folder. And then I review that every day. And so I never have an email that's not being responded to. If, if I need to, I'll ping them, I'll hit them again. Hey, you know, I haven't got an answer, I'll, I'll, I'll forward that same email and say, I haven't got an answer, you know, can you get back to me on that? So every day, at the, end of, at the end of my day, I go through my sent emails and I move everything either to a project folder, if it's an issue that's been settled, or if it's something I need a response, it goes into my waiting to reply fo folder. So at the end of every day, my sent folder is empty. The next thing is written documents. Even in today's world, there's no way we're gonna get around not having written documents. We're in construction. You're gonna need written documents. So I've actually tried to become more of a paperless office lately. And, um, and I still have documents, but they're just electronic copies. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about a paperless office when we talk about a cloud-based construction management system. Okay, so I've organized these five methods of communication in a spe specific order. And they're from fastest to slowest. Right? If you want to, if you want, you just have a few, a few seconds, boom, you can send a text message. Written documents can take minutes, even hours. But these same five methods are also in reverse order of the amount of detail that you can communicate, right? So a text message is fast, but it's the least amount of information that you can communicate with. Where a written document, you can do really complex uh, communication. So in today's world, with all these other forms of communication, you know, a lot of times stuff doesn't get uh, put down in writing. But I really feel that the written word is still king. It is still the most important form of communication. You know, even if you go onto a job site and you get some decisions done there in a meeting, I always say document everything, you know. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. No matter how much you trust your client, it's not about trusting them, it's just about memory. It's just about, if you have a phone conversation, send a quick email, hey, you know, per our conversation, this is what we decided, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, the next thing, is, including documenting everything, is, you know, save your documents, save everything. Um, when I get a key decision or a key uh, information on a text message, I'll take a screenshot of that text message and email it to myself so I can put it into that project folder. And CCs, I love CCs. I CC people all the time. I know some people don't like it. My wife, she works with me. I'm always telling her, come on, you gotta CC me on that. And she's like, oh, I don't wanna bother you. I said, no, please, CC me on everything. That's how I know, and I can quickly get rid of it if I, if I don't need it. CCs are another great way to keep your husband and wife on the same page, right? So when you, when you need a key decision, you send it out, and you CC the other person. You know, sometimes I'll get a message back from the wife. Oh, we've chosen, you know, this tile and whatever, a square foot. So I'll reply back and I'll CC the husband. You know, hi, Denise, got your message about the tile, and I copy Jim. And then she may get back to me and say, you know, you really didn't have to copy Jim on that email. And I'll say, you know what, Denise, you know me. I'm all about, you know, communication and keeping everyone, you know, on the same page. And besides, remember, we want to avoid that ultimate cost of construction. Okay, so the next thing about utilizing communication effectively is embracing technology. You know, uh, contractors are notoriously slow to adopt new technology. One of the things that I work with my coaching clients the most on is effectively utilizing technology. So I remember 10 years ago, I showed up at a job site with my first smartphone. It was a Trio. Any of you had a Trio? It was like a glorified Palm Pilot? Yeah. And I remember showing it to the builder, and I was like so proud. I was like, you know, Brian, I can send and receive emails on my phone. I don't have to go back to my office anymore. 
And he just looked at me, you know, he has kind of a grizzly beard and kind of old style contract. And he's like, Ed, why would you want to do that, man? That just gets in the way of building. I don't want to ever have to send emails from the job site. So now 10 years later, of course, Brian has a smartphone. He's sending and, and receiving emails all the time from the job. So another thing is by quickly adopting new technology, you can set yourself apart from your competition, which can be a great advantage when you're going up against another contractor. OK, so I know this is not a typical tool that you'll find in most builders' tool belts, but I really believe that tablets and iPads are going to be just as indispensable to the construction industry in a few years as smartphones are now. So uh, let me see a show of hands. How many of you uh, use a tablet right now in your business? Actually, let me start with this. How many of you have a tablet? All right. How many of them use it in your business? Wow, OK. So again, it's not just about having the technology. It's about utilizing it and being able to be effective with it. So one of the best utilizations of uh, a tablet, I think, is a cloud-based construction management system. So this is, I think, going to be the next big thing in residential uh, management, or residential construction, is a construction cloud-based systems. So I think it's going to be the biggest thing in residential construction since the introduction of sheetrock. OK, not really. But you know, like when we first started building with sheetrock, think about how much easier and faster things went, right? Because you had things done before. You could just run through the project. That's the way a cloud-based construction management system works. So um, there's lots of different systems out there. Let me see a show of hands. How many people use a cloud-based system? So yeah, a couple of years ago, it looks like it's about half the room. A couple of years ago, it was like hardly anyone. So what, so give me some uh, names of what, what systems are you guys using. Co-construct? Co Builder trend? Pro-contractor? Client? Client red. So there are lots of great programs out there. I'll tell you this. I think there's a lot of really good programs out there. And each of them have their own strengths and weaknesses. I really believe that different programs work best for different businesses. And I've actually consulted. I've looked at, at several of them. And I've, um, I've consulted my clients on several of them. So if you have some questions, if you want some input, I can be happy to tell you afterwards. Um, so one of the things that I love best about a cloud-based system is that they're constantly making improvements and adding new features. Because you know, they don't have to send you a disk, a software disk in the mail, right? They just post it up there on the cloud. And the great thing is, like when I get, I just get on my phone, and like every three or four weeks, my program will say, oh, you know, we've added this new feature. Watch this video on this new feature. Or, you know, oh, hey, we've added you know, some extra functionality to this, this, or we've just fixed a bug. It happens all the time. And the great thing is, is that once one company adds like a new feature, the other company goes and copies it, or does it a little better. So they're always trying to outdo each other. And the, the beneficiary is us, the builders, right? Because they're in this super highly competitive atmosphere, and they're always getting better and better. So a cloud-based uh, construction management system, it's like a central clearinghouse. It's a, just a really effective method for coordinating every aspect of a project. And because it can be accessed at any time, for anywhere, from any device, it's pretty easy to now access our project information. So this is the main screen of the program that I use. And I use it to coordinate every aspect of the project. But, uh, budgets, bids, schedules, plans, email messages, finish selections, daily updates, progress photos, change orders, punch lists. And those are just the modules that I use. This program has lots of other modules, like a lead tracker, CRM lead tracker, uh, timesheets, uh, customer satisfaction surveys. Another great thing is you can actually reorganize that. And you can put whatever items that you want. Like someone made a joke. They said, you know, why do you have the current weather on your main screen? You live in San Diego. It probably says 77 degrees and sunny, you know, 350 days a year. So if, if that's not a big deal, you don't need it on there. You know, some areas where you've got weather issues, it, it's important to have it on there. And it can actually track when you post a daily update. It'll post in there what the weather, what the weather was. So when you're going back and wondering why there were construction delays or whatever, you can document the weather. OK, so let me quickly go through some of the benefits of a cloud-based construction management system. So the first thing is that all team members are sharing the same updated plans, the same current specs. So it avoids the confusion that you can have when you've got two of your trades looking at different sets of specs or different sets of plans. 
I like to say everyone is singing from the same hymn book. So next is that it improves the efficiency by eliminating duplicate tasks because it's so easy to hand things off from one person to the next because everyone's accessing the information at the same time. And because of this greater efficiency, it also increases your ability to take on more jobs and to pr improve the quality of your existing jobs. Next, it's a great marketing tool, right? When you go to a new prospect client presentation and you show up with your iPad and you can show them all of these amazing features that your homeowners are gonna be able to access, they're gonna love that. So as an owner's rep, I work with a lot of out-of-town clients and they love this system because they're not where the construction is happening, but they can get on this, they can see photos every day, I send them construction log updates, I'm updating the schedule, so they really feel like that they're part of the project even if they're not visiting the job site every day. Last and really most importantly is now you have this central place where you can store all of your documents, so it can really improve your construction risk assessment because you've got all of those documents, everything together. And God forbid, hopefully you don't ever need it for, for a, a legal situation, but if you do, you've got all that documentation. You don't have to go back through a bunch of file boxes to find that information. Okay, so the biggest challenge that I find with working with my clients when they decide to go to a cloud-based system is how to successfully implement it. So I've learned a lot of lessons between myself implementing it, I did it three years ago, and now working with a lot of my, my business clients, um, coaching clients on how to implement it. So here's the lessons that I've learned. First is be selective. You know, don't think that you have to use all of those modules that I showed you before. If you have a lead tracking or a CRM program or like an estimating program that you like, stick with it. Don't get rid of it, just keep using it. I mean, ultimately you may switch over, but don't do it initially. Next is take it in steps. The biggest mistake that I find with builders is they try to just do everything at once. They'll say, okay, as of February 1st, we're gonna go completely in the cloud. That's just a recipe for disaster, you can't do that. What I recommend, how I recommend doing it is you do it in steps and you introduce it to your customers first, figure that all out, then introduce it to your company and lastly, introduce it to your subs. And I'll go into more detail about that in a minute. So one bit of warning here, don't try to use the cloud-based system for all email correspondence. Now I know some programs want you to do that. They want you to send and receive every email through that program. But I find it's very hard to get all of the parties to play along with that. And the system breaks down when one person sends an email and it's not part of the cloud-based system. So let me tell you how I use emails within my cloud-based system. So each of my projects has a unique email address that's linked to my cloud-based system. So anytime I'm sending an email to my homeowner where I, it's an important email and there's, I'm either confirming a decision or asking them for a, an important question, all in the CC line, I'll put in that cloud-based email address. So that way it'll go to the cloud. And then when they reply, it'll also go back into the cloud. So any important key decisions are all documented in the cloud. Now, if they send something to me and it's not in there, what I'll do is I'll just forward it to that email address so it's in the cloud. So by the end of the job, I have all of that important correspondence. I don't have 5,000 emails, I may have whatever, 200, but they're just the most important ones related to those decisions. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more detail about how we implement this. So for clients, really, this is all I use for my clients are those four modules. So I think you start with introducing it to your clients for two reasons. The first is you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. One of the best things about a cloud-based system, it is a great marketing tool. And once you get this going with your clients, they are gonna love it so much that they're gonna be raving about it. And that's the whole point of this presentation, right? Building happy homeowners. So they're gonna be a happy homeowner, they're gonna give you lots of referrals, you'll get a lot of business out of it. So, um, the other reason why I say to start with the, with the clients is these are very easy to implement. You can basically have one person taking photos of the jobs, uploading documents, posting daily logs, and updating schedules. So there's a builder in San Diego, he's actually hired me to do this for him. And I handle all of this for his clients. He doesn't even know how to use the system at all. No one in his company knows how to use it except for me. Yet his clients get all of the benefits. He only uses it for his out-of-town clients and he's a luxury condo builder. 
So, but I go in as the owner's rep and I do all of this and I work with the homeowner on and he's just getting the best reviews from his clients because they absolutely love it. But it's really simple to do. Okay, one bit of caution here is be careful when you start to implement the finish selections with your clients. Um, I've found that that can be a difficult process. You've got to make sure that not only the client, but their interior designer knows how to use that finish selections pro program because it can be very frustrating and intimidating if they're always getting these emails saying, hey, you missed this deadline. Okay, so next, after you've got your clients um, into the system, then introduce it to your company. You know, you'll already have created a buzz among your employees when they're talking to your clients and they're going, God, we love this cloud-based system. So now they'll be more, more, more motivated to implement it themselves. You know, if you just try to go to your bookkeeper and say, hey, this is how we're gonna do all the billing, they're like, why? I mean, you're trying to make my life harder. But if they have talked to a couple of their clients and they're talking about, God, we love this cloud-based system, they'll be more motivated to do it. So it takes two parts to implement it within the company. The first is with the bookkeeping staff, like I said, your accounting staff. So it's invoices, payments, change orders, and budgets. And then the second is with your crew that's out at your jobs, right? And that's time cards, punch lists, uh, to-do lists, daily construction logs. Now, some of these programs, they have this kind of internal communication where you can post comments or things like that. I find that's very hard as well because people aren't checking it all the time. I think it's just better just to use text messages and emails for that. Okay, so third is the subs. The subs are the most difficult people to get into a cloud-based system. And several of my clients, they've tried, and then they say, oh, you know what, I just gave up on the cloud-based system because we couldn't get our subs to do it. And you know, we tried with the subs and it didn't work. And I say, well, you, that's the last people that you get on. Now, how you motivate subs, it's kind of like your own employees. You get them to see how much easier it's gonna make their job, how much more quickly they can get change orders approved, how much more quickly they can get paid with online payment systems. You know, they call you and they say, hey, where's my check? And you say, oh, I did an electronic transfer in the online system. His money's already in your account. They're like, wow, that's great. So remember the job with the gas line in Dr. A. So typically what you do, you know, if that happened, you tell the plumber, okay, you know what, go home, send me a change order, and when I get an approval, I'll get you back out to the job site. So instead what I did, I told my, my plumber, I said, Jim, send, text me a couple pictures and, and your price and a little details of it. And then I took it, I prepared the change order on my phone, and I sent it off to Dr. A in the cloud-based system. So when Dr. A got out of surgery, he could pull up the change order on his phone, look at the change order, and actually physically sign that change order on his phone. So then Jim, I had sent Jim to lunch because I was hoping I could try to pull this off, and it fortunately worked out because the doctor was just getting out of surgery. So then I called Jim up, and I'm like, I got a signed change order right here. Come back to the job and finish it out today. So he was blown away. And then they're much more willing to work on the other parts of the cloud-based system that you want them to, like for, for preparing bids, documenting punch lists, and warranty items. Okay, so one of the best benefits of a cloud-based system is it's so great for creating a project closeout package, right? You've got one central place where you can have every document that's related to the project. So this is great for both the homeowners and for the builders. So for the builders, it's great, again, for that construction risk management, right? You have one place where everything is kept. Remember I talked about the paperless office? Well, now I don't have file boxes filled with papers at the end of a project that I've got to go and, and, and file somewhere. Everything is stored up in the cloud. Now, for homeowners, the great thing for them is, again, they've got this really comprehensive documentation, and it's a great marketing tool. I've heard people talk about you know, using building a closing out package and using that as a marketing tool. So when you show up and you show your homeowners, hey, these are all the documents. At the end of this job, you're gonna have all of this stuff available. Now, all of these documents are available on the cloud for as long as you have that program. But if the homeowner says, you know, I wanna have this stuff, I don't wanna trust on the cloud, you can just download all of this stuff onto a thumb drive. And they can keep it on their computer, you can keep it on yours, and you've got a permanent record of all of this information. Okay, so let's quickly go over the keys to effective communication that we just talked about. First is choosing the right form, the rich, which of those five, based on speed and content. Second is get it in writing, right? Document everything. Third is don't be like your competition that's slow to adopt technology. And lastly, implement a cloud-based system and use my tips on how to effectively implement it. 
Okay, so we've talked about understating the homeowner's perspective. We've talked about effective communication. The third point is managing client's expectations. Now, communication methods, you can work on those throughout the entire project. But managing client expectations, you have to do that from the very beginning, right? So, you know, there's uh, uh, lots of things that the homeowner has to understand about it and how unique a home construction project is. Some of those we talked about earlier. And even after they get over those issues, you know, the fact that the pricing is variable and that it takes so long to get their product and they don't really know what they have until it's done, there's a few other important characteristics that they need to understand before the job begins. So the first is to explain to them that their job is a prototype. Now, in today's world of constantly updated software updates and annual product improvements, a homeowner is not used to, to buying a prototype. And although they may not like to hear it, their home is a prototype. You know, you as the builder, you basically have one chance to get it right. You can't, you know, after they move in, issue a software update after three months to fix all the problems. So it's important, too, that the homeowner understand that no one has ever built this project before, you know? And no one will ever build it again. And even if you're a kitchen remodeler and you say, look, I've built 50 kitchens before. Yes, but you've never built that exact kitchen with those exact materials in that way. And when you tell a client, you know, oh, I've done 50 kitchens, they think you've done that exact kitchen 10 times before. You know, they don't know, right? They're used to thinking about, you know, a car. And building a construction pro project is not like building a car, right? Ford goes through hundreds or thousands of prototypes before they put a car out on the road. And that's not the case here. So once you explain it to them, once they know that they're actually getting a prototype, they'll understand the process better. And they're more tolerant of the uncertainties along the way, especially if it's an engineer. If you have an engineer and he understands that you're basically building a prototype, he's going to be much more forgiving of the entire process. OK, so next is to educate the homeowner on the uncertainties related to the construction project. As I talked about before, you can't really know in a demo what's behind the walls until you've actually demoed the walls, right? So it's important when you have a remodel that you talk to your clients about that. And no matter how good the architect is, no matter how great his plans are, you know they're never perfect, right? There's no way that he can work out every detail and have every connection correct. And even if he could, the homeowner, you know it's going to change their mind along the way, like I talked about earlier. It's just a natural part of the process. So again, you need to understand and, the, and, and you need to get your client to understand that you basically have one chance to get it right, right? And you can't go back after this point and, and make corrections and build it a second time. You can't. You got one chance. You're building that prototype once. Okay, so the next thing that I like to prepare my homeowners for is the emotional ups and downs that they're going to go through on a construction pro project. In my 17 years of working in residential construction, the biggest issue that I have found is dealing with the homeowner's emotions. And a colleague of mine has actually written an entire book about this. It's called uh, Managing the Emotional Homeowner, written by David Lutberger. And in this, uh, in this, David has this great chart, which I use all the time. This is really a great chart. Um, it gives the homeowner the complete idea of what's going on throughout the whole process. So I have some copies of this. If you would like it at the end, uh, come up and I'll, I'll give you one. I, I, think, I give it to every one of my clients. I think it's just the greatest thing. So the thing is that you, you can't just give it to them at the beginning and then have them forget about it. You've got to refresh their memory. So for example, I'm working on a custom home right now. And we were in the design stages for two years because it's in a master association and the design review committee was out of control. So my client was getting really frustrated. So like nine months ago, we finally started construction. And so right about the time when we were just finishing framing, this guy is like over the moon, right? Because he's been waiting so long. And now it's like every day he shows up and like it's closer and closer to being done. So I pulled this out and I said, you know, Craig, I don't want to burst your bubble, but we're right here right now, right? <laughs> So I just want to tell you what's coming up, right? Because the next thing we're going to do is rough in. So for the next month or more, we're going to be roughing in your, your electrical, your plumbing, your HVAC. And you're going to keep showing up, and there's not going to be any new walls. It's not going to look really much different than what was there before. And then we're going to end up all the way down here. 
So and at that point, then we're going to start hanging drywall. And actually, it'll start moving up a little bit, because now you'll start to see the walls coming together. But after we hang all the drywall, well, then we're going to start taping and texturing and sanding. And that takes a long time. And it's really messy. And again, you're going to think like nothing is happening. And at some point, we're going to end up all the way down here. So I just am warning you, all right? But then at that point, you know, things will start to look up. Once we start to install painting and tile and, and the plumbing fixtures, you're going to think it's great. But I also want to warn you, because then at that point, you're going to want to throw a party. And I'll tell you right now, the house isn't going to be done. When you want to throw that party, it's not done yet. We're still going to have some finished items and a bunch of punch list stuff. So I'm just, just warning you. OK, so the next thing in managing client expectations is educating them about a schedule. You know, a construction schedule is dynamic. It's a living, breathing entity. It changes all the time. I love to say that once a construction schedule is printed, it's out of date. I mean, the minute you print it, it's out of date. So this is something I do uh, when I'm sitting down with a, with a builder and I have my, my client with me. And you know, the builder has his nice proposal together and it's got his budget and it's got his schedule. You know, what does the homeowner do? Right? They open it up. They don't read all the stuff. They go right to the bottom line of the budget. They want to see how much it's going to cost. And then they flip forward on the schedule and they want to see when it's done. So I'll do the same thing. And I'll say, OK, you know, Jim, I see you've got us finishing on this date. And I'll turn to them all. I'll say, I'll, get, I'll take a bet with any of you. It's not going to be done on this date. And the, you know, the contractor glares at me like, what's this guy doing? You know, and the homeowner looks at me quizzically like, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, I just know it's not going to be done on this date. It may be sooner than this date. It may be after this date. But it's not going to be on this date. And if I've educated my homeowner well, I, I remind them, remember I talked about all of these uncertainties and how things change all along the way. But it just it shatters that expectation that the client has being attached to that schedule. You know, if the, if the builders put in November 15th, it just shatters that idea that they're going to have Thanksgiving dinner in their new home, right? So that's one of the things I love about a cloud-based schedule, because you can always be changing the schedule. I am on every one of my projects. Every week, I'm changing the schedule. Because every week, I have more information. It may just be kind of minor tweaks. Sometimes it really changes the, the end date. But my clients start to understand that. Every time they get on the cloud-based system, the schedule's different. So they start to see, oh, wow, everything's changing on the schedule. So it's like, oh, well, when are we going to be done this week? Well, let's get on the schedule and let's see. And the other thing I love about a cloud-based system is even if you have the whole schedule worked out, which you should at the start of the project, you don't have to show the homeowner at all. You can just show them the first four weeks or the first two months. So if you have an engineer, you know, just show them the first two months, because you know there's a lot of changes down the road. And it's never going to be finished when you think it's going to be on that original schedule. OK, so the next thing is, you know, as a construction professional, I love a Gantt chart, right? You can see all the dependencies, predecessors. You can track the critical path. But homeowners, they're not used to that. I find that homeowners really like a traditional calendar schedule which is available in most cloud-based systems. What I do is I'll color code all of the trades in the calendar schedule so they can see distinctively which, you know, which trades are what. And in my program, like, there's like five different shades of orange. So what I'll do is any, any uh, trades that are linked, I'll use different colors of orange so that they can see which trades are linked to which other ones. OK, so the last thing I want to talk about with managing client expectations is change orders, right? So change orders, the important thing with change orders is your clients have to understand that they are a normal part of construction, right? By now, you shall all understand that changes happen all the time. There's lots of uncertainty. But again, it's a process. It's a process. It's not a product. So as that process develops, as they become more educated, they're going to make changes along the way. And you have to approach it that way as well. Don't be embarrassed about a change order. It's a natural, it's a natural part of the process. Now, if you have a cost plus, most of my clients I try to recommend to do a cost plus basis because of that reason. But if you're on a fixed bid situation, just make sure you understand there's nothing to be embarrassed about with change orders. So the next thing is you got to make sure that there's no surprises. You can't wait and then just give your client a change order. You got to communicate in advance, right? Like I said from the very beginning, like if you've got an engineer, make sure that you're communicating what those changes are and that they're going to impact a change order. Next, you know, never wait until the end. I've had this happen before, right? The contractor sends at the very last bill, they send their change orders. And it's for a framing thing that happened a year ago that the client can't even remember. 
And lastly, on a change order, remember that you need to add days as well as dollars, right? Every time you make a change, it doesn't just impact the budget, it oftentimes usually impacts the schedule and the general conditions and all of those things as well. Okay, so let's quickly go over the managing client expectations, which is getting the homeowner to understand that it's basically like building a prototype. Second is educate them on the ups and downs of those emotions that they're gonna experience during the process. Next is viewing the construction schedule as dynamic, right? It's constantly changing. And last is recognizing that change orders are a natural part of the process. Okay, so these are our three keys to building a happy homeowner. So uh, let me just real quickly review with you what each of them are so that you can get it in your, in your brain here. So understanding the homeowner's perspective, first is that the homeowner really has little understanding about the construction process and doesn't realize that it's a process, not a product. Second is they have this inherent mistrust of contractors. If they've watched any of those reality TV shows, they just can't help themselves. Next is you're dealing with their home, their most valuable and sensitive project. Next is to use that introductory survey that I talked about in order to identify their preferences for communication and decision making. And last, know how to identify difficult clients by asking that one question and then anticipate how to deal with them. Okay, under the keys to effective communication, there were four points, right? The first was choosing the form of communication that's most effective of those five that we discussed. The second is get everything in writing, right? Get it documented. Next, don't be like your competitors that are slow to adopt technology. Adopt that technology early, and one of the best things you can do is use a cloud-based construction management system. And then lastly is managing client expectations, right? Getting them to understand about that prototype, about the emotional roller coaster, that the schedule is constantly changing, and that change orders are a natural part of the process. So like I said, the, the handouts, the summary slides, I don't have all the slides, but the summary slides are available there on the Builder Show or on your app. So let's just finish where we started. So here's Zach. Zach today now realizes that he focuses on the process as well as the product, and that he's building two things. He's building a quality project, but he's also building a happy homeowner. And as a result of that, he's getting lots of referrals from his happy homeowners.